Hello everyone. I would like to uh, welcome you to bringing Azure Linux workloads to Windows Ask the Expert session. We'll get started in just a minute. Okay, welcome to the uh, uh, Azure IoT Edge for Linux on Windows uh, discussion. Uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Azure IoT Edge for uh, Linux on Windows. We call it internally uh, eFlow. You might see that used uh, in certain areas, or even here on the doc uh, in, on this slide. Um, Azure IoT Edge for Linux on Windows is a um, enables Linux-based uh, cloud workloads, our Azure IoT Edge workloads, to run on Windows in a virtual Linux environment. It's kind of a hybrid platform uh, that allows for uh, you to run Azure IoT Edge for Linux on Windows. We provide a um, Microsoft-supported uh, Linux virtual machine, um, and I mean Microsoft-supported, it's curated, um, we build the, the virtual machine. Uh, we build Azure IoT Edge into that virtual machine, validate it as a set, and then uh, deploy it onto the Windows device under hypervisor. Uh, one of the things that's unique about this is we, um, we manage it as a Windows feature as opposed to a Linux feature. Um, that means that your IT admin uh, doesn't really need to know much about Linux to deploy this sort of a uh, uh, environment. We manage it through uh, Windows. Uh, we do Windows updates uh, to maintain the virtual machine uh, in a current state and um, um, and so forth. There's no uh, no need to do any package management of the environment. Um, it's all scripted through PowerShell on Windows, so it's kind of a, uh, a bit of a black box in terms of an environment for running uh, edge workloads. We do provide a ability to get into the virtual machine to uh, run uh, virtual uh, Linux commands to inspect it, but we're also working um, uh, introducing a window, Windows administration through Windows Admin Center that gives you a UI for um, uh, installation, wizard, and, and so forth. Uh, we'll be adding additional functionality there for management uh, and configuration through Windows Admin Center. Our target operating system is uh, Windows Pro and the Enterprise uh, uh, 2109 or um, 2019, actually, there's a typo on my slide. Um, uh, build 17763 or later. So uh, any release uh, after the uh, uh, latest LTSC release, Windows IoT LTSC and server LTSC, 20, uh, sorry, server 2019. Um, the environment requires uh, the, the physical device to have a minimum of 4 GB of RAM. This is because we need to spin up the, the smallest virtual machine that we can spin up uh, to host this is 1 GB. So we'll have, uh, uh, sorry, phone's ringing in the background. I apologize for that. We, we need to have uh, so much free memory uh, available to start up that virtual machine and 4 GB uh, physical memory is the as the lowest we can go. Now we can spin up larger virtual machines. Uh, if you if you need a 2 GB virtual machine or a 4 GB virtual machine, depending on your uh, the workload that you're trying to deploy on this in, in this environment, um, you can go up from that point. Just know that the the larger virtual machine you go, the the larger physical uh, the the more physical memory that you will need to be able to support that uh, that virtual machine. The system will require about uh, 10 GB minimum uh, to start with. This is to uh, support the uh, the virtual machine that gets created and servicing. 
And um, now you can also specify a larger storage if you need a larger storage in that uh, the virtual machine that you create. And that will also increase the amount of uh, storage that's required by the deployment if you elect to you choose a, a larger VM. This, this solution, uh, as I mentioned before, requires a uh, hypervisor. And uh, if you are running this in a virtual machine, so if your host is a virtual machine, you'll need support for nested virtualization. Uh, or if you're uh, running this in an Azure VM, you'll need to choose a compute unit that supports uh, hyperthreading so that the nested virtualization or the Linux virtual machine can be started inside of that host virtual machine. In terms of the uh, target audience for this, the you know what we're really uh, targeting is those those uh, uh, customers that are uh, primarily Windows uh, environments, and um, you may have an IT department that is uh, well versed in Windows. Uh, may also have a management infrastructure in place that. Um, it is therefore managing Windows devices, and it's expensive to spin up uh, those resources for a new operating system. So this allows you to introduce the, the Linux environment to your, uh, your deployments without that cost of, uh, you know, the knowledge of uh, Linux in your environment or spinning up a control plane to manage uh, your Linux systems. I mentioned earlier that um, from an update perspective, um, you don't have to worry about keeping your Linux environment up to date or even Azure IoT Edge up to date. We do that uh, for you using the Windows update uh, infrastructure. Uh, there's a functionality in, I'm sorry, I'm bringing up a screen. I'm gonna share a screen here with you. Um, there is a functionality in Windows Update that allows us to configure and add support for updates received from other Microsoft products when you update Windows. This, with this mechanism on, you can see it's managed by my organization here. It's grayed out um, because it's a, a policy here at Microsoft that we have this enabled. Uh, but you'll have control of this to be able to turn it on and off. And with it on, the Windows Update Agent will detect updates available for Azure IoT Edge for Linux on Windows um, so that um, they'll automatically come down, will update the environment, keep the Linux environment as well as uh, Azure IoT Edge up to date while preserving the data for your workload. So if you have workloads already deployed to this environment, we preserve that and uh, we just swap out the underlying operating system and keep that current. Let's see, are we any any questions coming from the audience? Uh, any specific things that you would like me to uh, address? From a, um, so we'll talk a little bit more about uh, functionality that we have available in this platform uh, now. Um, so we do have some pass through uh, capabilities for hardware, cap uh, enabling hardware connectivity for uh, devices that may be connected to the, uh, to the system. For instance, if you've got a, a, a Modbus connected via serial, or CAN bus connected via serial, that sort of thing. We've got a serial pass through uh, uh, sample code that we've got built into the virtual machine to support serial pass through, as well as sample that's available on our GitHub uh, that show, that demonstrates how to connect those uh, serial devices up to the, the virtual machine. The question uh, that has come in, uh, so to be clear uh, about the use case, this is a Linux VM uh, meant to run in an environment uh, 
as a Linux VM only managed as uh, a Windows box. So this is a, so Azure IoT Edge for Linux on Windows is a, uh, a Linux virtual machine with Azure IoT Edge built into it. And uh, we're, we're running that on a Windows device. Yes. Talk a little bit more about uh, from an AIML perspective, uh, if you wanna run, uh, connect this up to your uh, camera, for instance, to do Im image inferencing. Uh, we do support um, USB cameras uh, in a sense. We actually transform the feed using RTSP into an IP feed so that the modules inside the virtual machine can receive the uh, uh, the streaming uh, data feed. And this is also uh, built into or available through our uh, AZ eFlow uh, samples. So I want to point out some resources to you down here at the bottom of the screen. Let me zoom into this a little bit. Um, our documentation is available at uh, aka ms az eflow docs uh, This will be a, a, a quick start uh, as long as reference materials for uh, getting started with eflow. Uh, on our GitHub, we've got a wiki. Uh, release notes and sample code, uh, as well as an issues forum that allows for you to interact. Uh, you know, if you have any issues, um, you know, we can we can support some uh, uh, some issues uh, there. Uh, if they get more involved, we would ask that you go through our support uh, organization uh, for repros and and that sort of thing. So Terry, we have a question here. Um, okay. How is Eflow different from Windows subsystem for Linux? Yeah, it's a great, very good question. So the main difference between Eflow and WSL um, is at, uh, Eflow is a fully contained virtual machine. Um, it is uh, meant for running production workloads. Um, Azure IoT Edge workloads uh, built, you know, it's 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 meant for running uh, those sorts of workloads. Whereas Windows Services for Linux is really meant for uh, development purposes. So if you're uh, writing, uh, if you're developing a Windows application um, a, or console, uh, a Linux console application, you would use Windows uh, Services for Linux as your as part of your build environment. It's not meant for production use uh, for a, a workload like this. Uh, another major component, major difference between eFlow and WSL is the servicing model. While eFlow's servicing model is similar to the Linux kernel that is used in WSL, uh, with WSL, you've got to acquire your own user, uh, user land through uh, the Windows Store. And then that is that spins up um, uh, dynamically based on whatever user land you you want to use with WSL. The underlying process manager, though, between uh, eFlow and WSL is eFlow uses System D. Uh, so if you're familiar with Linux, System D is really built for managing. Uh, uh, supporting Docker type environments uh, with Docker containers and can spin up child processes. Whereas uh, WSL is really meant for a single process launch and does not support um, uh, child processes. It's, um, it, it's using Sysinet uh, as its process manager. So you can think of it as WSL is for R&D purposes where you're building an application. eFlow is for production purposes where you're uh, deploying an, uh, a workload. So from a uh, workflow perspective, you might start off building a, uh, the code for your module in WSL. And then once you package that into a Docker container, you would then deploy it to eFlow.
Another question has come in from Daniel uh, for Windows 10 IoT Enterprise LTSC. How are the updates for Linux virtual machine done automatically or manually? We expect the computer uh, to be deployed in remote locations over low bandwidth internet connections and are not sure how large the updates would be. So these updates will work similar to um, your, your quality updates for uh, for Windows. Your monthly updates would uh, would be uh, presented to uh, to the device, and you would have the opportunity to control what updates actually get published down to the device. If you're using a tool like WSUS uh, to uh, to gate the the deployment of those updates, you could turn off the updates uh, for these uh, non-inbox features, if you if you like, and download those manually from uh, the Microsoft Update Catalog, and uh, manually deploy them on the device as at, if you wish. So they would be very similar to a uh, a monthly quality update. Like I say, it could be could be manual or automatic, depending on how you configure your Windows update uh, policies. Another question from Richard: Being a VM, does that mean I could uh, have multiple uh, machines on one host? Not sure if there's a valid use case for it. Just curious. Um, no, actually, we do limit uh, the instance uh, of one per device. Uh, as an edge device, this is uh, typically, you know, you might have a device in a remote location um, monitoring, let's say, you know, predictive maintenance on machine hardware and that sort of thing. So um, it's really meant for that edge compute scenario, not being a uh, uh, and certainly not server class hardware to run multiple virtual machines. A follow up from Daniel. So the IoT Edge runtime and hub versions are also automatically updated by the managed Linux virtual machine, uh, or can we control the updates? So, <clears throat> Azure, uh, so eFlow to start with, uh, we will be releasing based on the LTS version of Azure IoT Edge. Uh, this is Azure IoT Edge 1.1. I think we're uh, in the process of incorporating 1.1.3, uh, which is uh, just being released uh, publicly. And we will keep that up to date, um, uh, always on the latest. So when uh, when the next update to 1.1 becomes available, we'll incorporate that into our monthly update and keep that up to date. The uh, Edge uh, Hub and uh, Edge Agent uh, runtimes will be tied to the 1.1 release. We will eventually uh, provide support for uh, the su successor to Azure IoT Edge 1.1, but it's important to note that 1.1 is the LTS release of Azure IoT Edge that is supported through uh, December uh, 2022. So this will be a stable release and uh, you won't have to worry uh, much about those versions uh, uh, changing and breaking something. And as far as controlling the update, the update is is all in one. So it is a, a virtual machine with the Linux environment and Azure IoT Edge baked into it. So when we do release the monthly updates, it's got all available updates for uh, both the Linux environment as well as the uh, Azure IoT Edge packages to keep those current, uh, address any um, uh, critical fixes, uh, security fixes uh, that come out on a regular basis. OK, 
Can you run uh, Linux Docker containers in eFlow like you can in uh, WSL2? So in WSL2, I believe you need to uh, uh, use Docker Desktop in order to run uh, containers in, in WSL2. Uh, with eFlow, we're using, we use Mobi uh, built into the uh, virtual machine and it will run uh, um, Linux Docker containers, but primary, those that are deployed through uh, Azure IoT Edge, uh, not, uh, not uh, local deployment. Okay, Linda's asking about uh, uh, what type of Windows admin tools are eFlow targeting to be used in lieu of. Um, so <clears throat> eFlow um, will be able to, will be using uh, PowerShell scripting. So you can do remote PowerShell to access the, uh, the virtual machine environment. We're also, uh, enabling um, an eFlow specific extension to Windows Admin Center. Windows Admin Center is kind of, a, it's a point to point um, management solution, provides a single pane of glass uh, through your browser. Uh, think of it as a progressive web application that gives you access to similar functionality that you would uh, with like remote desktop. But we've got a plugin that is specific to uh, uh, eFlow that allows you to, that, that we'll be adding to over time to support um, configuration and management and diagnostics uh, with a Windows uh, user experience, if you will. Um, we also, because we're using uh, Microsoft Update uh, in extension to Windows Update, you'll be able to use any, um, uh, Windows management infrastructure that you have that you uh, to gate whether you know how you deploy Windows updates to the device. So there's also a question here about using GPU compute and eFlow, uh, like uh, virtualization, para virtualization in WSL2. Um, I'd like to call on a, uh, my colleague, Christopher uh, Datsikis, to come on, and he's the one that's working on this for our team. And he can provide a little bit more details about uh, the GPU implementation. Chris? It's all yours, Chris. Hey, thanks, Terry. Can you hear me? Yep. Great. Yeah, so we understand that uh, hardware acceleration uh, is an important feature for customers who are deploying AI ML um, uh, workloads onto uh, their devices, um, especially uh, given that the majority of these workloads are, are Linux based. So for that reason, we are actively working on uh, hardware acceleration uh, support. And our strategy is to uh, begin with a certain uh, set of hardware uh, support and then uh, extend that over time based on customer feedback. So in the uh, immediate future, um, our plans include supporting uh, the uh, NVIDIA T4 uh, accelerator, um, as well as uh, supporting uh, some of the NVIDIA uh, GeForce and Quadro accelerators like you see uh, in WSL2. Um, in the future, we also um, look forward to uh, supporting uh, some Intel-based uh, integrated GPUs as well. Uh, in fact, there is uh, another build session that is focused on um, WSL uh, combined with Intel. Uh, we look forward to enabling that similar technology 
on uh, eFlow in the future as well. Terry, I'll uh, hand it back to you. Thanks, Chris. So we've got uh, GPU support on the way. Um, as Chris said, um, uh, we're enabling the support in, in eFlow and it'll uh, be available in the uh, Windows build soon. It's available in Windows Insider um, uh, for, for right now, uh, hopefully available in, in, the in the future or it will be available in the future. So provisioning work uh, um, workflow for eFlow. <clears throat> I did a video on channel nine uh, not too long ago. Um, uh, we'll put a, uh, maybe I can get uh, Francisco to add a link to uh, AZ eFlow uh, dash show. This is a, a video that we did uh, earlier in the year that showed the walkthrough of a uh, eFlow pro uh, provisioning experience using our Windows Admin Center um, uh, installation wizard. So um, uh, we just walk through the process uh, screen by screen, and at the end, we provide a connection string. And at the end of the installation wizard, we're up and running and connected to the uh, IoT hub and uh, workloads are uh, automatically starting to flow down from the device twin, the deployment manifest there. It can also be done through, uh, through PowerShell. Uh, so you'll see uh, if you go to the documentation page uh, that we've got you know, listed here. Let's see if I can get into it. Uh, AKA MS AZE flow docs. There's a quick start there. Um, if you follow the quick start uh, of the installation, you get down a little ways and there's uh, there's tabs uh, where you can choose between a Windows Admin Center uh, experience, instructions for a Windows Admin Center experience, or uh, you can uh, select um, uh, PowerShell. See if I can pull this up, and I'll just we'll just take a look at it, so I can show you exactly what I mean. Um, so if I go here to deploy code to a Windows device, and I scroll down, this is the standard documentation for Azure IoT Edge, and we'll get down here a little ways. We uh, let's see, device. So this is where we get to the point where we can actually. Uh, install Windows Admin Center, and then uh, the quick start is just that. So let me get to one of the other ones here. Just a second, create an IoT Edge device, install, run IoT Edge for Linux on Windows. This one's got the instructions that I was talking about. So we get here to create a new deployment, and I can choose here between Windows Admin Center or PowerShell. So if you per prefer PowerShell deployment, just select the, the tab here, and then um, it's all PowerShell. It can be fully scripted end to end. And while I've got this screen up, I wanna show you, um, so this is our uh, GitHub repository, and I wanted to mainly show you uh, the releases link here. Uh, we've been in, hopefully it'll let me get there. Uh, we've been in public preview for a little while. You can see, uh, you can give that an, uh, a, a, a test drive if you would like, uh, but we'll also be publishing information about each release as we are um, coming out. So Chris mentions GPU support and, you know, as we add new functionality and every, one, every update that we publish um, the monthly updates. You'll get information in the in here about what has changed in in one release to the next. We've also got a wiki uh, here. All these all these links are, are are on the page here as well. So so take a look at both the documentation and the wiki for any information about uh, about eFlow. Let's see. How do you imagine the next version of IoT Edge, like uh, version 1.2 or higher LTS, 
to be updated um, when that time comes. A whole new virtual machine. If so, could we uh, ship out USB flash drive and have our local host perform upgrade for us without consuming metered data? Um, yeah, so the when we provide an update to the current 1.1 that we're supporting for LTS, this will be a, a separate installation. So there will be an, uh, an, uh, a separate MSI that contains the virtual machine. That MSI can be downloaded and uh, uh, installed separately. So it doesn't necessarily have to all come down uh, from that, uh, you know, directly to that device. You can you can load it, uh, side load the uh, or manually install the MSI. That's not a problem. But it is going to be an opt-in update. Uh, when we go from 1.1 to 1.2, for the very same reason, I think Daniel, you mentioned earlier uh, about, you know, do you have control of when when you have those updates? So when we are when we're saying within a single version, yes, we we are. When we are going from one major version to the next, it's an opt-in. It's a you have to choose. So I believe we're running. We're uh, uh, really tight on time here. We'll stay around for any additional questions that come in, uh, but I believe that's our session for uh, for today. Uh, feel free to reach out to us on uh, the uh, on GitHub. Uh, happy to answer any questions you have there as well.